Good morning. This is Pastor Lynn with Goodland United Methodist Church. We're going to complete our session on the number of days it is until we get to Easter. And today, it's four days until Easter. There it is, Wednesday. We invite you for Bible study tonight, Wednesday night live. Doors open at 6, worship at 6.15, and classes start at 6.30. In the Gospel of John, we have these words. Jesus came stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, so send I you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. What a glorious trusteeship is ours. Jesus breathed on his disciples and imparted the Holy Spirit. This blessed comforter was about to be fully born in the power of the day of Pentecost. But as Jesus breathed on them, he gave them this assignment. Just as the Father has sent me, so send I you. His assignment from his father is in some ways no different than our assignment from him. Jesus had come to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind. He came to set free the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In this description of his calling, we hear the description of our own calling. Jesus boiled his assignment down to its roots idea when he said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Consider the glory of our assignment. We have been given the calling to help change the destiny of souls. As Jesus was sent, so are we. The breath of Christ, how the church needs it, and yet how we turn away from it. So often when we say or we sing, Holy Spirit, breathe on me, we really mean, let me taste and feel the power of the Holy Spirit, but don't make me do anything that would embarrass me or take too much time. But to receive his glorious Christ is to allow him to breathe into us his wonderful empowerment. Once empowered, our joyous duty is to go into the world doing exactly what he did, seeking and saving those who are lost. So, I ask you this question. Who can live without this empowering breath? Or better yet, who would want to? Our thought for the day? Do you long for the adventure of living in Christ's power? Well, stand still and receive. This is Pastor Lynn. Have a great day. this morning from Psalm, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For well, thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And from Revelation, John, number nine. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude, which no man could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands.
Word of God for the people of God. I invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. John 19, 23 through 27. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and his sandals and divided them into four shares, one for each soldier. His shirt was seamless, woven as one piece from the top to the bottom. They said to each other, let us not tear it. Let us cast lots to see who will get it. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my clothes among themselves, and they cast lots for my clothing. That's what the soldiers did. Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This morning we come to the third of the seven final statements that Christ made from the cross as we continue with our series, Famous Last Words. In the first message we heard forgiveness. In the second, salvation. And today, the importance of family. The love a mother has for her son is unique and special. What greater love than to assign your best friend to the care of your mother? If you had to choose someone to look after your mom, who would it be and why? Seven times Jesus pushed up on his feet, grasping for breath. And in each of these moments, he uttered seven statements that are so profound with meaning and purpose that it would be a lifetime to ponder them. These seven statements are the famous last words of Christ. We all know that words have tremendous power. It's been said that words are more powerful than a two-edged sword. Words have the power to heal and the power to wound. Words have the power to give hope and the power to despair. Words have the power of peace and the power of destruction. But most importantly, words are important because words have the power to impact eternity. As the Son of God, as the King of Kings, as the living Word of God, Jesus knew the importance of his words from the cross, and that's why he spoke them. Of all the famous last words that have ever been spoken, there are none greater than these that we study through this season. And so today, woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. Jesus wanted someone who he thought would truly care for the well-being of his mother to look after her once he was gone. John the beloved. John the man who stood beside him through thick and through thin. His third statement from the cross was spoken for the sake of two people, and yet Jesus what he said to them can apply to each one of us. From his viewpoint on the cross, Jesus sees the Roman soldiers. He sees the crowd and the priests who were there to mock him. But most importantly, standing close by, he sees five people that are dear to his heart. I want you to picture Jesus looking at the crowd and he sees these five people, just five. 
Where are the others? Where are the ones that he called to follow him? All of those other disciples. Where is Peter who said, I'll never deny you? He sees these people at the foot of the cross. Five people who dare to stand close enough to the cross, knowing that their closeness to Christ could result in their own arrest and in their own death. That's a message that speaks volumes today. Could you do that? If your best friend was about to die in a gas chamber in a prison, would you be there to watch? He sees his mother, Mary, his mother's sister, Salome, the mother of James and John. He sees Mary Magdalene, one whom he brought out of sin. Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and then there's John, the beloved. They all stood there watching, waiting. They knew the cost of going to the cross, and yet they were there anyway. Why? I want you now to picture Jesus as his eyes scan across the faces of the crowd, looking for those he had hoped that would be there. The rest of the disciples, looking across the crowd, he doesn't see them. But standing near him are these five people that they dare to come in spite of the Roman soldiers and the religious leaders. And before we look at his third statement from the cross, there are two very powerful life-changing messages that are here. First of all, the message that speaks of those who would dare to draw close, even at great cost to themselves. Who are they? In this time, you are either following Jesus and seeking him, or you're not. We can talk about the cross. After all, we weren't there, were we? We didn't have anything to do with it that happened thousands of years ago. Well, the cross is still very real today. And had it not been for the cross of Jesus Christ, you wouldn't have a reason to have faith. You wouldn't have reason to come to church. You wouldn't have reason to believe there was eternal life after this one. To experience the cross, you have to go to the cross and determine for yourself who this man in the middle is. Just how close would you be willing to have gotten to that cross had you lived in that time? When I speak of going to Christ, and standing in the presence of the cross, I'm not speaking of backing up and standing in front of these crosses, but of a spiritual relationship that you should already have with Christ. Are you willing to risk your life to stand so close to the cross that his blood pours out upon you? Are you willing to face the ridicule and the scorn of the world so that you can stand close to the cross of Christ? These are questions only you can answer. The choice is yours, and only you can decide just how close you're willing to stand. These words are the answer to what you've been searching for in your life. If you desire to be close to Jesus Christ and his cross, if you desire for your life to have purpose and meaning and fulfillment, then you must become his disciple and a disciple who loves Jesus Christ far above anything and everything and anyone else in the earth. That's the answer your heart is looking for. Jesus once said in Matthew, 
He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Any one of us can hide in the back of the crowd in the far distance and call ourselves disciples. But a real disciple is the one that gets up close and personal and gets into the lives of the people around them to make sure they know who Jesus is. Are you looking for the true purpose of your life? Do you want your life to have fulfillment and to impact eternity? Then you must choose to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Again, how close do you want to be to the cross? Here in this passage of John, the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part and also a tunic. Now the tunic was without a seam, as I had read earlier, but they didn't choose to tear it. They decided to cast lots for it. Why? These soldiers are closer to Jesus than anyone. And yet, they are clueless to what was happening. These soldiers who sat in the shadow of the cross heard every word that Jesus spoke. They saw the noonday sun turn to darkness. They saw the breaking of the ground. They felt the earth shake like jello. They saw the inscription that proclaimed him king of kings on the top of that cross. They even saw all of those unique miracles, and yet they were still unmoved by what they saw and were absolutely clueless about what it meant. Here's the point. Like these Roman soldiers, many in the world today gamble their lives away even as though they are in the shadow of the cross and are clueless about the cross and its power to save them. The world knows who Jesus is. You know who Jesus is. The world talks about Jesus. Bill and I were sitting together watching television last night, and we came across a documentary movie about um, Madeline O'Hara. Anybody remember what she did? She took prayer out of school, one woman. She was a vowed atheist and said, I don't want my son to have to sit in class and and recite a prayer that, that I don't believe in. And in the end, she was executed by some kidnappers because they knew that she had a wealth of money in the Cayman Islands or New Zealand, and they wanted her money. They didn't care about what her cause was. There are many who wear a cross around their neck, myself included, and yet have no idea what that cross means. The saving grace in the story of Mount Madeline O'Hara is one of her children did find Jesus. One of her sons turned away from what she said. I implore you to not miss the meaning and the purpose of the cross in your life. Can you imagine these soldiers stepping into eternity and discovering what they have missed at the cross? I don't think I wanted, would want to be them at that time. They were at the cross and they missed it. The religious leaders were at the cross and they missed it. The thoughtless crowd was at the cross and they missed it. But five people standing at the foot of the cross understood what was going on. So what does it mean and how does it fit in with us and the cross? 
What does it mean to stand at the foot of that cross? Mary's heart was pierced when Herod killed the children of Bethlehem because of Jesus. Her heart was pierced at the whispers that Jesus was conceived in shame. Her heart was pierced when Jesus' brothers rejected him and mocked him. Her heart was pierced when Jesus' hometown rejected him and wanted to throw him off a cliff. This is all in the Bible, by the way. And finally at the cross, when the sword slices through her heart, she watched him suffer and die on that cross. And when she lifted up her eyes to the cross, she remembered when she would kiss his brow and now it was covered with thorns and blood. She remembers the moments when she held his little hand, the same hands that were now nailed to that cross for her salvation. And she remembered the time when he said to her, my hour has not yet come. Do you remember that story? The very first miracle of Jesus turning the water into wine. She knew he could do it, and she asked him to, and he was obedient to her, even though he knew it wasn't time yet for him to begin ministry. We see this, and we see Mary's sorrow. But what does it mean for us? How does it become part of who we are? We read that the soldiers divided his garments, she could see them dividing his garments, and she could hear them gambling over the clothes. What do you think that made her feel? And yet, even in that very hour, Jesus was thinking of her when he looked down from the cross, and he said, Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. You see... Jesus gives us an example of a God-given responsibility to our blood family. It is God's design and purpose that we take care of one another. We see him as he looks down and says, Behold your mother. We hear the power of these words. With eternity hanging in the balance, Jesus takes this moment to care for his mother. God knows how messy it can get in a family. Anybody have any family problems? Wake up some mornings and you wonder why you're married to that person? This past Thursday, Bill and I celebrated 14 years of being married, and his response was, it's been that long that I've put up with you? <laughs> Thanks a lot. The family Jesus grew up in was not a perfect family, and yet he didn't use that as an excuse for the way he turned out. His brothers were not at the cross. They didn't believe in him. It was a source of conflict in his own personal family. And knowing the sorrow and the suffering his mother was experiencing, he wanted her to have peace. He wanted her to know she would be taken care of. John and Mary are not blood-related. John is not the son of Mary, and yet Jesus is giving him the honor of looking after her. On a physical level, Jesus is making sure that his mother is cared for, and yet there's a steeper meaning than that. The power of these words on the cross, not only is Jesus demonstrating the importance of caring for our earthly family, but more importantly, he's demonstrating that when we become members of his kingdom, we become members of his eternal family. And our membership into his family is far greater than our earthly ties. I guess the bottom line of this message this morning is we who love Christ as Lord and Savior are one great big family, and we need to be in the business of taking care of one another. The moment you choose to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become part of that big family. 
Mary and John had one thing in common. They both loved and believed in Jesus. They were more than just friends. They were family. The moment you become a believer in Christ, you immediately become a member of a great eternal family. And if you are a believer and follower of Christ, then you are a member of God's family. Think about how big that family is. Millions of people love Jesus. Today, you and I can have the same opportunity Jesus gave to John at that cross. And this is how it works. In Mark 3, 31, Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? He looked around the circle of those sitting about him. Here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, and my mother. All who love Jesus, all who seek to do his will, are members of his eternal family. Whatever you do for other believers, it is the same as if you were doing it for Jesus. And so I invite you. When Jesus said to John, Behold your mother, what he was really saying was for John to take care of his mother until he returns. So until Jesus comes back, let us love one another, care for one another, be there for one another, the same way Jesus called John to care for Mary. That is the will of God for our lives as believers. We are to love one another. Amen. I invite you to stand. Our closing hymn is on the back of the insert in your bulletin.